So here's what we're talking about. If not everyone who calls Jesus Lord, Lord is a true disciple of Jesus, how do you know the difference between people who are inauthentic and the real ones and in a crowd of people claiming to be Christians, how do we really experience Jesus for ourselves? Now this morning, we're going to look at a story from the Bible when someone from the massive crowd following Jesus asked that question, took a one-on-one meeting with Jesus face-to-face and asked Jesus that question. And this morning, by listening to Jesus' answer, we're able to get some clarity on how to become more authentic in our faith and in our walk. Now this fall, we're in a series uh, that we've called Rediscover Church. And I think this is so important because we need to take a look at the church again. I am so convinced that most people have either taken church for granted and we've forgotten about the grandeur and beauty and power of what God's people are as they gather. Or folks have, for a bunch of reasons, written off the church as broken, useless, or outdated. But the fact is, Jesus says that he is building a church and evil cannot overcome it. God's people together is God's plan A in Scripture for making this world a better place, and it's really hard to find a plan B. And for all the reasons that people in our culture may have moved on from church, the new habits we've invented don't seem to make things better. We're more isolated, more polarized, and discouraged than before. So we're looking at what God has called his people to be and do together in maybe a fresh way. And so far, if you've been here, we've been looking very carefully at what church is. And if you were here for the last couple weeks, you know that we've got two really big categories for talking about the capital C church. Theologians have made a distinction between the visible and the invisible people of God. Now, the big group is people you could see. The visible church, lots of people who worship the Lord. Now, how do you know if someone is part of the visible church? Well, just ask them, right? What do they say? Uh, Right now, there are about 2.6 billion people on planet Earth who would say, yes, yes, I am a Christian. That's a giant number. It's a global group. Like, we we may think we know what church is like because we go to one, but the global international church probably looks different from what you may imagine. In fact, you might be shocked at what an average church in the world looks like. Actually, I'm just going to ask, any guesses, anybody know offhand where the fastest growing church in the world is? Like, group of people, there's more people than before. Any ideas? Okay, as far as I could tell, number one, the country of Nepal, number two, China, number three, the United Arab Emirates. Not what I would have guessed, right? They're not making worship albums or anything, but the fact is, today, the average church might look more like a huddled group of refugees in Poland than folks like us sitting in comfortable pews in New York. And you need to know this, Jesus is building a church way bigger than you think it is, and it might not look the way you imagine it. And that should both humble us and give us a bit of a sense of calm confidence. God is so faithful. And the earliest Christians changed the world by valuing the powerless, the humble, and caring for the most vulnerable people. That's the visible church, the huge crowd behind Jesus following. The problem is that from the first disciples onward, some of the large crowd doesn't seem to be in it for the right reasons. Jesus says, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, but what's he say? Not everyone will enter the kingdom of heaven, says Jesus. In other words, not everybody who checks Christian on a survey really has faith or follows Christ. This isn't new. Even in Jesus' group, there were 12 disciples and one betrayed him. And ever since then, We'd have people in the crowd who haven't been real. And that's been really tough. It's messed up things. It's hurt people. It has damaged the reputation of Christ in really big ways. So theologians have a second term, the 
invisible church. There's a big crowd of people who all say, Lord, Lord, but what really matters isn't what they say. What really counts is what's in the heart. And here's a problem. No one can see your heart except God. So last week we talked about it. We heard what Jesus said to do when that stresses us out. Like, what do you do when people who claim to be Christian act the opposite? What do you do when Christian leaders are predators or when church communities become toxic? What do you do when people you've looked up to fall hard? And Jesus said, watch out for wolves. We talked about this. And he also said, this was last week, in three different parables, only God can see the heart. We talked about this last week. The problem is you just can't tell. Like, it's not color-coded. You can't tell a difference between a believer on a bad day and an evil person pretending to be good. So Jesus says, instead of writing people off, just be patient. God brings justice. We talked about that last week. And this is... I think I was honest last week. I, I don't like that. <laughs> like, I, I like to think that I'm a good judge of character. I, um, I, I think in general, we all see people. We deep down like to think that we can evaluate people, that faith looks like looking a certain way, almost that you can reduce faith to a set of behaviors or philosophy or something that you could see it and measure it, and sometimes it looks good, but Jesus seems to say that faith is different from religion. It, you can't see it. What is it then? Now, I'm excited because this morning I'm so excited to tell you a familiar, famous story about someone who exits the crowd and gets a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Jesus, and we get to hear Jesus answer that pointed question. If faith isn't about what I'm doing to save myself, if faith is about something going on that I can't see, what is it then? Or to use Reformed Protestant language, if I'm not saved by works or merit, what am I even doing here? I want to encourage you to open your Bible to the book of John chapter 3. I'm going to flip around a bit to other parts of this, but you know, let me give you the backdrop of chapter 3. Here's how chapter 2 ends. John writes, while Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. It's a crowd. This is weird though, a strange verse, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people, which is our theme, right? There's crowds. There are people following Jesus in a massive, massive group, but Jesus could see what none of us could see. Jesus sees the heart. So, again, this is a strange line. He would not entrust himself to them. Next verse he did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. And what we see next, if you flip through the book of John, is a set of conversations. Jesus is about to, like he's talking to the crowd, but he's also having four conversations that point to him seeing what no one else can see. So if you flip around, the next couple chapters, you see Jesus answering that question. So he talks to a handicapped man at the pool of Bethsaida. He talks to a Gentile government official. He talks to a Samaritan woman. And here's what's fascinating to me. Jesus goes from talking to the crowds to individuals. And here's what's weird about it. For the most part, Jesus pursues talking to people who would never be included in the visible people of God. Like, if you could just look at someone and know people, know their heart, and we all do this, there are certain people who you sort of go, well, clearly this person is not part of God's people. Not a Christian, not a good person. Uh, we all imagine what that might look like. But back then, if you had to imagine that, you'd say, okay, let's see, 
who doesn't belong, well, literally, who, doesn't, who isn't allowed to go into the temple, you'd pick a, a Samaritan woman, like, you show me a morally ambiguous cult member, and I'll show you someone who is probably outside the people of God. That's who Jesus talks to. Then he talks to the Gentile government official. Again, someone else not allowed in the temple, uh, the enemy. Uh, Then he talks to a handicapped guy. Back then, uh, again, things have changed. Handicapped guys weren't allowed in religious groups. They were unclean, and those are the people Jesus talks to. And, And I think in the next few chapters, he intentionally challenged the assumption that you know what's inside of people's hearts that you can look at someone and know their heart. The true church is invisible because you can't see it. And actually, if you follow the story of the Gospels, this becomes a scandal for Jesus, the friend of sinners, because he makes time for people who didn't belong in the group. But he starts off this series of four conversations with the only person in the whole group who is allowed to worship in the temple. A man named Nicodemus. He looked like he belongs. And here's a story. John chapter 3. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. And he came to Jesus at night. Now Pharisee is sort of a bad word now, but back then it was a really good word. Like all the heroes in the Old Testament would have identified as as Pharisees, godly people. Uh, Now we think of it as maybe hypocritical, but these were the heroes of the Old Testament. This would have been your Nehemiah, Ezra character. Pharisees were really, really serious about God. In fact, if you see the word Pharisee and you think hypocrite, you're missing the whole point. This is someone who looks like they belong. If it were today, this would be someone who uh, does their devotions every day and post their verses on Facebook while listening to Christian radio in their car on the way to uh, serve in the food pantry or something. In fact, the text goes a little further. He's not just a Pharisee. So he wasn't just a holy person. He was a member of the Jewish ruling council. Like he's part of the elite. He was an influencer, made decisions, in fact, about religious and non-religious life. In verse 10, like Jesus calls him, quote, Israel's teacher. This is a prestigious guy. As if he wrote the book on how to look like the people of God. You'd almost imagine that he is an expert in every gesture, a facial expression, every jargony, religious, theological term. Here's someone who memorized the Bible like it was his job. He would have won sword drills. Uh, Of course, I'm joking about Facebook and the radio. Um, This is a Risky analogy, I guess, but a, a holy Jewish person might be a little bit like a contemporary Orthodox or Hasidic Jew. Like, you know what that's like, right? Uh, Orthodox Jewish people, like Nicodemus was, they're, um, they're not hard to see. You just look at them and go, this person is a holy or not holy Jew. You could do that today, right? And for this sect, religion is as visible as how you dress, what your hair looks like, how you conduct yourself. Like you can walk around the mall or Legoland and go, here is somebody who is following what Nicodemus did, following a thousand Bible-based religious laws as a way of showing in really visible form that they're a part of God's people. Non-visible, obvious to anybody that they belong in that group. That's Nicodemus right here. And that's not bad. I'm not knocking people like that. But um, in fact, this Pharisee was a lot like the heroes of what we'd call the Old Testament. Nicodemus is a good guy in the story. He believes what a lot of us subconsciously believe, that being part of the true followers of God, or to use the Old Testament language, the remnant, is as simple as how you act, how you dress, eat what you do on Saturdays. You could do it. And he's having a meeting with Jesus that's awkward because he he has a problem. And here's the problem. It's really simple. Jesus is doing miracles. And you can't deny what he's doing. There's these signs that point to the fact that God must be with Jesus. And the problem for Nicodemus is Jesus doesn't look like he belongs in the group. 
So a religious teacher who's worked hard at belonging to this group of God's people shows up to see Jesus at night, maybe because he's studying late, maybe because he doesn't want anyone to know. He's asking Jesus a question, and here's the problem. He goes, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher from God. Like, nobody could perform the signs you're doing if God wasn't with him. In other words, I'm a good teacher. If I do a good job and say the right things, people remember what I said, but you like say stuff and God does miracles and, and you don't look like us or act like us. And please don't tell anyone I said this, but I can't explain why God is blessing you when you don't look like us. So just tell me what I'm missing. What else do I have to do, more or less? And Jesus responds, answering his question and our question. How do you become the real thing? What do you have to do to get faith? That is Nicodemus's question. So Jesus gives an answer. Jesus replies, very truly I tell you. Nicodemus, here's what you got to do. Take notes. Step one, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. And Nicodemus basically goes, wait, what? <laughs> Seriously? Like, uh, tell me something I can't do. Like, tell me what I can or can't do on Saturday. Tell me how to do my hair. Tell me how to raise my family. Or tell me how to drive or not drive my minivan. Like, all that is stuff I can do. Uh, tell me what to read or memorize or listen to or sing. Whatever, I'll do it. Uh, seriously, Nicodemus is a very religious, holy, pious person. He would do anything. Except this. <laughs> like, he's like, born again? Or the Greek is ambiguous. It's born from above. Nicodemus says what anyone would say. I, I can't do that. Give me something to do. And Jesus just buckles down. He says, verse 5, Very truly I tell you, no one, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of spirit. Flesh gives birth, gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. And I imagine Nicodemus is going, tell me how to do this. And Jesus just says, well, it's like the wind. It blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound and you feel it, but you don't know where it's coming from, where it's going, so is everyone born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus is stumped. He's not used to being stumped. And there's a lot of things that are confusing about Jesus' answer. There's a water thing. Is this baptism? Is this Ezekiel prophecy? But maybe the most offensive thing Jesus says is simple. Do you know what you got to do to have God love you and have God be with you like he is with me? You know what you got to do? Take notes. Here's the question. G Nicodemus goes, Jesus, God's with you. What's your secret? And Jesus goes, here's a secret. Um, it's not anything you do. It's what happens to you. Belonging to God isn't a measure of your resolve. It's not a trophy you get for good behavior. It's not like, like God, I, I can give you a list of things to do to make God notice you and pay attention if you only get all this stuff done, God will be with you. It's, it's like the wind. There it is. God, you, you just can't manipulate or control God. You just experience him. You don't manufacture or summon God like a genie or something. God's like the wind. And this is not a good answer. It's not just offensive to someone who's been consumed his whole life at working so hard to create a religious conduct and culture, it's, it's saying he can't possibly do what he's trying to do. And then Jesus, again, buckles down, you're, you're, Jesus, you're Israel's teacher, and you don't understand this? Which hints at a very Christian idea that by studying what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, we're convinced it all points to Jesus, that you should see Christ in the Hebrew Scriptures. And then Jesus says, I, I tell you, we speak to what we know and we testify to what we've seen, but still you do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you, Jesus says, of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? 
He just goes there. And then he says, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who's come down from heaven, the Son of Man. And Jesus puts a label of divinity on himself. Here's the thing. Jesus is saying, I'm from heaven. What do you do that? Here's what Jesus says. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Jesus references, I'm going to be honest, a very strange Israelite story that Nicodemus and everybody else then would have been familiar with. If you don't know the story, it's in Numbers 21. Read it. Basically, it goes like this. There's a crisis. God's people, Israel, there was a whole group of people who were dying because there are poisonous snakes everywhere, and they're getting bit by poisonous snakes. I'm going to be clear. I'm not a doctor. Don't take my medical advice. But um, if I got bit by a poisonous snake... Do you know what I would do? I have no idea. Like, I'd, I'd, I'd probably panic, right? Uh, I can tell you what I would do. I would do something. Like maybe I'd try and calm down, do breathing exercises. I've, um, I've watched a lot of Westerns, and I'm not really sure if like, you're really supposed to like, uh, cut out where the fangs stuck in and try and suck the poison out. But I would probably try it. I, I don't know. Mo- movies have lied to me a lot. Uh, I think I saw John Wayne like tie a, a belt around his leg to, to cut off curt circulation. I don't know if that's good or not. Movies, again, have lied to me about a lot of things. But let me tell you what I would do. I would do something. Like I'd probably, uh, maybe I'd, I'd, I'd Google WebMD, what do you do when you get bit by a snake, right? Uh, maybe I'd, I don't know, maybe you'd find me running down a hill to uh, urgent care really quickly. You know what I wouldn't do? I wouldn't do nothing. (laughs) Like, you would not catch me just sitting there going, oh, looks like I'm dying from a snake bite, (laughs) right? I would do something to save my life or the life of my loved one. And and the the weird part of the numbers story isn't just that God sort of invites poisonous snakes to bite people. But you know how the story goes in numbers? Uh, Moses tells God's people there's a very simple way of curing yourself. And Nicodemus knew it. Nicodemus would have preached sermons on this. Moses makes a bronze figurine, it looks like a snake, and puts it on a stick. And everybody who looks up from their snake bites at the snake is cured. You may not believe me. It's in the Bible. Nicodemus would have taught this. But everybody in Jesus' time would have got it. Here's how the story goes. Uh, People got... Well, think about people in numbers, right? You get bit by a poisonous snake, and you're busy trying to fix yourself, and Moses says, do nothing, uh, just look up. I wouldn't do that, I'll be honest. If I got bit by a snake, I would be walking to urgent care before I just sat like, in church not doing anything. But the weird part about the story is everybody who kept trying to fix themselves died from a snake bite, And everybody who stopped working so hard and looked up at the snake, God saved them. And Jesus says, you know that story, Nicodemus. That's what it's like. The Son of Man is lifted up, and you look up from all your work and efforts that you work so hard at trying to improve your condition, and you look up from all that, and you trust Jesus to make a difference and to give you new life. Like, Moses wasn't shouting out WebMD instructions. He wasn't telling in the number story. Moses isn't going, look, you know, try and slow your heart rate down. Uh, That's going to help the poison slow down. He's not saying, like, make cuts on your legs or get essential oils or something. All you do is look up. Stop all the stuff you're trying to do. Look up at the Lord Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And Jesus says, Nicodemus, 
you are an expert in trying to save yourself. You dressed right, you act right, you are so religious, everybody looks up at you. And you look great. But getting the life you're looking for isn't something you can do for yourself. It's something God does. So stop working so hard at saving yourself and look up and believe in God's Son. God is like a powerful wind. He just shows up. And you can't see it or predict it or manipulate it, but God changes everything when you trust him and he brings eternal life in him. So trust the Son of Man lifted up. Now let me tell you the craziest part of the whole story. This is where it ends. If you've got one of those Bibles that has like red letters in it, this is the end of the red letters. I don't know what Nicodemus does. I don't know what he says. This is just where Jesus stops talking. And it's so bizarre because Jesus is at the beginning of talking to a bunch of other people. And Nicodemus, at the group of four, is the only one who doesn't do anything. Like the religious guy, the, the only one who's allowed to go into the temple doesn't do anything with what Jesus tells him to do. You can read the rest of it. The handicapped guy uh, picks up his mat and walks, goes to the temple. The Gentile government official believes and his son is healed. The Samaritan woman believes and tells everyone she knows about Jesus. The one religious guy in the whole story, the one guy who would have been allowed to come and worship, doesn't believe. It's an argument from silence. I get it, but every indication we have says nothing changes about Nicodemus. He's there, head down, working on himself, trying to cure what's killing him, never stopping to look up at Jesus, never getting everything he's actually looking for. This is the striking and tragic answer to our question. If not everyone who calls Jesus Lord, Lord, is a true Christian, if not everyone who checks off Christian on their medical form really knows the Lord, how do we know the difference between the fakers and the real ones? Now, it's, this is a very tragic, tragic story because what the story of Nicodemus tells us is that some of the most religious peop, religious looking people you know are so busy working on themselves that they will never have the humility to look up at Jesus. That's tragic. Because there are people who check off all the right boxes. They know the things to say. They know the things to do. But they've never taken the time to look up and see Jesus. This is a tragic story. This is why the true church is the invisible church. You cannot see people's hearts. John's story is about the person who looks the best having the least amount of time for Jesus. And that is an unspeakable tragedy. It's also a striking story. Because how do you become authentic yourself? How do you fix yourself? It's something you might never guess. The fact is being a Christian is as simple as to stop working so hard at fixing yourself, to stop working so hard at saving yourself, to just look up humbly at Jesus believing in him. And when that happens, Jesus says that God does something incredible to you. He accomplishes what you could never do for yourself. Of course, the Apostle John, like me, is uncomfortable ending the story in verse 15. Jesus ends in John 3, 15, and John has to add his own sort of inspired reflection, and I'm, I'm glad he did. Here's the very next verse. Not spoken by Jesus to Nicodemus, but spoken by John as he reflects on this. A familiar passage. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That is how you join 
the invisible church. The gospel is, I think Tim Keller says it so well, the, the gospel is this, that we are more sinful and more flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the same time, God, God loves us and accepts us in Jesus more than we ever dared hope. And here's what happens. When we look up to him, God changes things. He gives us new birth and new life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, could you do what we cannot do? Can you give us faith to trust your word? Can you give us what's so hard, the courage to look up from all the things that consume us and distract us from all the things that make us feel guilty and give us shame? Can you help us to lift our eyes beyond and above our helplessness to the power and love of your Son? And Father, as we do so, could you give us the Spirit Give us fresh life, fresh energy. Give us a new way of seeing and loving you. Could you give us faith? I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.